Good morning, Carol. Have you got some time to talk with me about exchanges with offerers? Sure, Jack. Have a seat. Thanks. I have a pretty important competitive buy coming up, and I was looking at FAR 15.306. I want to make sure that I fully understand the three types of exchanges after receipt of proposals and how to use them. Okay, where would you like to start? Let's start with some basic definitions. Clarifications are a very limited type of exchange of information between the government and the offerers that may occur when award without discussions is contemplated. Communications are a broader type of exchange of information that may occur after receipt of the proposals, but before the competitive range is established, when the government contemplates establishing a competitive range and conducting discussions. Discussions are the broadest type of exchange of information that may occur and they occur after the competitive range is established. Have I got that right so far? Yes. Okay. What has me a little confused is how these three types of exchanges relate to each other. Why do we have three types rather than just one or, or maybe two? Let me try to clear up your confusion by giving you a little history. These three types of exchanges in the current form came from the FAR Part 15 Rewrite, an acquisition reform initiative that went into effect on January 1, 1998. You must keep in mind that there is clearly a predominant theme underlying the changes made by the Part 15 Rewrite. That theme is twofold. First, to foster and encourage open exchanges between industry and the government during an acquisition. Second, to expand the scope of the information exchanged during those exchanges. In fact, when Part 15 Rewrite was published in the Federal Registrar on September 30, 1997, the FAR Council itself described what the changes were intended to accomplish by using phrases such as supporting more open exchanges between the government and industry, allowing industry to better understand the requirement and the government to better understand industry proposals, providing early feedback as to whether a proposal is truly competitive, increasing the scope of discussions, and enhancing the ability of the parties to communicate and document understandings reached during discussions. If the predominant theme underlying the Part 15 rewrite is more open exchanges, then why is the scope of clarifications so limited? Because clarification is a type of exchange that is intended to be used only in a situation where the government doesn't really intend to have any exchanges with the offerers after proposals have been received. In other words, the government intends to award without discussions. Look at FAR 15.306A1. So, when do I decide whether I want to make an award without discussions? You are supposed to decide before the solicitation is issued. In fact, FAR 15.306A3 says that award can be made without discussions only if the solicitation has notified the offerers that the government intends to evaluate proposals and make award without discussions. So, obviously, you'd have to make the decision before the solicitation is issued. Also, let me show you something else. If you look at FAR 15.209, it says that, when contracting by negotiation, if the government intends to award a contract without discussions, then the contracting officer shall insert the provision at 52.215-1, Instructions to Offerers Competitive Acquisition, and all competitive solicitations. However, if the government intends to hold discussions before making an award, then the contracting officer shall insert that same provision at 52.215-1, but with its alternate one. The difference between these two versions of the provision can be found in the wording of subparagraph F4. In the basic provision, subparagraph F4 states the government intends to evaluate proposals and award a contract without discussions, 
with offerers accept clarifications as described in FAR 15.306A. However, in the alternate one version of the provision, subparagraph F4 states, the government intends to evaluate proposals and award a contract after conducting discussions with offerers whose proposals have been determined to be within the competitive range. Okay, it's pretty clear that the question of whether I intend to make award without discussions is something I should answer during the acquisition planning stage. But under what circumstances should I consider trying to make award without discussions? Such a discussion may be appropriate where the acquisition strategy and the product or service being acquired is not very complex, the government's requirements are clear, and the proposal evaluation scheme is relatively simple. Okay, that makes sense. So, if I make a determination during acquisition planning that I intend to make award without discussions, then FAR 15.306A tells me that the only exchanges I can have with the offerers are clarifications. The FAR language also tells me that these clarifications are supposed to be very limited in scope. In fact, the language provides only three examples of matters that could properly be addressed using clarifications prior to an award without discussions. Relevance of an offerer's past performance information, adverse past performance information to which the offerer has not previously had a chance to respond, minor or clerical errors. My question is, can I use clarifications to address matters other than these three examples? Legally, the answer is yes. The FAR language refers to these matters as examples only. So you can use your judgment to address other matters using clarifications, but you have to be very careful when you do so. You may inadvertently throw away your ability to successfully make an award without discussions. What do you mean? If you inadvertently take the scope of your exchanges beyond what is considered a clarification and your acquisition is protested, your exchanges may be interpreted by the court or GAO as the opening of discussions rather than simply clarifications. And the rule of law is that if the government inadvertently opens discussions with one offerer, it must conduct discussions with all offerers who have submitted proposals. Therefore, if the scope of your clarifications is too broad, you may lose your ability to successfully award without discussions. So, if I intend to make a word without discussions, I must make sure that I label all my exchanges as clarifications, right? No, merely labeling them that way is not enough to protect you. It is the actual content of the exchanges, not your characterization of them, which determines whether discussions have been opened. Therefore, by conducting an exchange of information that you think is a clarification, you could actually inadvertently be opening discussions and totally frustrating your intent to make an award without discussions. What guidance can you give me on how I can make sure I don't inadvertently cross the line between clarifications and discussions? If you stick to the three examples expressed in FAR 15.306A, you should be safe. But if you choose to go beyond those examples, you will always be running a risk with respect to inadvertently crossing the line between clarifications and discussions. Guidance from the case law is not as clear as you might want it to be. Case law says the test is whether the exchange has given the offerer an opportunity to revise or modify its proposal. If it has, then the exchange will be considered discussions. On the other hand, if the exchange has only allowed the offerer to explain or clarify what is already in the proposal, then the exchange will be considered clarifications. However, applying this test is not as simple as it may sound. Why not? Because, in applying this test to each factual situation, the courts and GAO utilize two complex legal concepts to assist their analysis. The first is the concept of the materiality of the information exchanged. The second is the concept of whether the information exchanged is needed by the agency to determine the acceptability of the proposal. These two concepts make it even more difficult to anticipate in advance when you may be crossing the line between clarifications and discussions. The reason being that you 
often won't know whether the information you are asking for during an exchange is material or affects the acceptability of the proposal until after you have seen the offer's response. I don't want to scare you. I'm just trying to illustrate for you that knowing how to draw the line between clarifications and discussions is not an easy thing to master. Okay, you've convinced me that using clarifications where I intend to award without discussions is something I have to be very careful with. But this upcoming competitive buy is too big and complex to even consider awarding without discussions. So, in the circumstance where I intend to have discussions, are clarifications any easier to utilize as an exchange type? Actually, if you're not contemplating a war without discussions, then the only two types of exchanges you should be thinking about utilizing are communications and discussions. You would use communications before the initial competitive range is established, and you would use discussions after that initial competitive range is established. Why couldn't I also consider doing clarifications before the initial competitive range is established? I don't see anything in FAR which expressively prohibits doing that. While there is no express prohibition, it just doesn't make any sense to use clarifications if you intend to have discussions. Prior to the Part 15 rewrite, there were only two types of exchanges that were allowed, clarifications and discussions. Therefore, if you wanted to conduct any sort of exchange of information before setting the initial competitive range in opening discussions, the only type of exchange that was available was clarifications. But the rewrite changed that. It gave us a new type of exchange called communications. As you recognized earlier, the FAR defines communications as a broader type of exchange than clarifications. Since communications has a broader permissible scope, it stands to reason that any exchange of information that you could legitimately conduct as a clarification can also easily be conducted as a communication. However, it also stands to reason that there are many exchanges of information that can be conducted as a communication but could not legitimately be conducted as a clarification. Therefore, if you intend to have discussions but need to conduct exchanges with offerers before you set your initial competitive range, there is no need to use any type of exchange other than communications. What the Part 15 rewrite intended is a two-pronged process. First, if you intend to award without discussions, conduct only clarifications with the offerers if needed. Second, if you intend to have discussions, Conduct communications with offerers before you set the initial competitive range and then conduct discussions with the offerers remaining in the competitive range. Okay. Communications is a broader type of exchange than clarifications. But just how broad is it? That is a great topic to talk about. The language at FAR 15.306b gives a fairly broad sampling of the types of topics that can be covered during communications including things of such as perceived deficiencies, weaknesses, errors, omissions, or mistakes. The language even says that these exchanges may be considered in rating proposals. The language also requires that these exchanges address adverse past performance information that the offer has not previously had an opportunity to comment on. Wow, that's pretty broad. Yes, by adding this new type of exchange called communications, the Part 15 rewrite significantly expanded the scope of the information that can be exchanged with the offerers before the initial competitive range is established. The language at FAR 15.306b also broadly states that communications may be conducted to enhance government understanding of proposals, allow reasonable interpretation of the proposal, or facilitate the government's evaluation process and are for the purpose of addressing issues that must be explored to determine whether a proposal should be placed in the competitive range. Why would the folks doing the Part 15 rewrite make the scope of communications so broad? They did that because the Part 15 rewrite also gives us a new, more aggressive standard for determining which proposals are to be included in the competitive range. Prior to the Part 15 rewrite, 
The standard for the competitive range determination was that you include any proposal which has a reasonable chance to win. But the Part 15 rewrite changed that. Now, the standard for the competitive range determination is that you include only the most highly rated proposals. The new standard can be found at FAR 15.306C. In fact, it even allows you to further reduce the competitive range for the purposes of efficient competition. To put it another way, the old competitive range rule of thumb used to be when in doubt, keep them in. But the new rule of thumb is when in doubt, throw them out. So how is this new competitive range standard related to my question about why the scope of communications is so broad? Well, the Part 15 rewrite recognized that if the government is going to be more aggressive in eliminating proposals from the initial competitive range, then the government should also have as much information as possible about those proposals before making that determination. In other words, we should be smart buyers and make the most educated and effective competitive range determination possible. Communications is the tool they gave us to accomplish that. In light of everything we've discussed, it would appear that anything that is reasonably related to the government's understanding or evaluation of the proposal can be addressed during communications, as long as it does not involve allowing an offeror to revise its proposal in any way. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm glad to hear that you recognize the key limitation on this broad type of exchange. That limitation is stated twice in the FAR, probably for emphasis. FAR 15.306b2 states that communications shall not be used to cure proposal deficiencies or material omissions, materially alter the technical or cost elements of the proposal, and or otherwise revise the proposal. FAR 15.306b3 again states that communications shall not provide an opportunity for the offerer to revise its proposal. You know what? I just realized something very interesting. This limitation language regarding communications is very similar to what we talked about as the test for determining when you cross the line between clarifications and discussions. That's exactly right. It is the same. When talking about crossing the line between clarifications and discussions, we talked about opportunity to revise the proposal, materiality, and acceptability. Now, when talking about the limits on communications, FAR 15.306b refers to the same three things. The language expressly refers to opportunity to revise a proposal and materiality. It also expressly mentions curing proposal deficiencies, which is essentially the acceptability of the proposal. And are the consequences of failing to stay within these limits the same as we discussed with respect to crossing the line between clarifications and discussions? Yes. If the scope of your exchanges inadvertently fails to stay within the limits placed on communications and your acquisition is protested, your exchanges may be interpreted by the court or GAO as the opening of discussions rather than simply communications. Just as before, the rule of law is that if the government inadvertently opens discussions with one offerer, it must conduct discussions with all offerers who have submitted proposals. Therefore, if the scope of your communications fails to stay within the limits placed on communications, you may lose your ability to eliminate any proposal from the competitive range until you have completed those discussions with all the offerers who have submitted proposals. So the difference between clarifications and communications is basically the scope of information that can be addressed and when they should be used right? Correct. This has been great. It's given me a much better understanding of clarifications and communications. So, now I think it's time to talk about the third type of exchange, discussions. Let me start with the minor point that often confuses people unnecessarily. In a competitive acquisition, the terms negotiations and discussions mean the same thing. Yes, I saw that mentioned in FAR 15.306D, 
which also says that discussions are exchanges that occur after the establishment of the initial competitive range. Yes, this is the only type of exchange that occurs after the establishment of the initial competitive range. I also noticed that FAR 15.306D says that discussions are undertaken with the intent of allowing the offerer to revise its proposal. So, once again, there is a reference to the aspect that seems to distinguish discussions from the other two types of exchanges, the opportunity to revise the proposal. But the FAR language seems to give it even greater emphasis here because it says this is the intent of the discussions. Yes, opportunity to revise the proposal is a key attribute of discussions. But the language at FAR 15.306D goes on to say that the primary objective of discussions is to maximize the government's ability to obtain best value, and that the scope and extent of the discussions are a matter of contracting officer judgment. Remember, while the scope of the discussions is left to the contracting officer's discretion, the clear intent underlying the Part 15 rewrite was to broaden what had traditionally been the scope and extent of discussions under the old FAR language. This new FAR language requires that discussions with an offerer cover significant weaknesses, deficiencies, and other aspects of its proposal, such as cost, price, technical approach, past performance, and terms and conditions that could, in the opinion of the contracting officer, be altered or explained to enhance materially the proposal's potential for award. As broad as the statement I just read is, the FAR language does not stop there. It goes on to say that discussions may also include bargaining, which includes persuasion, alteration of assumptions and positions, give and take, and may apply to price, schedule, technical requirements, type of contract, or other terms of a proposed contract. At FAR 15.306D3, the language even includes an example of the type of bargaining that would be permitted during discussions when it states, in discussing other aspects of the proposal, the government may, in situations where the solicitation stated that evaluation credit would be given for technical solutions exceeding any mandatory minimums, negotiate with offerers for increased performance beyond any mandatory minimums, and the government may suggest to offerers that have exceeded any mandatory minimums in ways that are not integral to the design that their proposals would be more competitive if the excesses were removed and the offer price decreased. I can definitely see what you described as the predominant theme of the Part 15 rewrite in this language. Talk about encouraging more open exchanges that are broader in scope. It is pretty obvious here, isn't it? Clearly, the Part 15 rewrite contemplates discussions that are very broad in scope, encompassing full-scale bargaining with the offerer until agreement is reached on the best deal obtainable from that offerer. This emphasis on conducting discussions to agreement and bargaining for the best deal with each offerer is substantially different from the traditional old-school emphasis on just giving each offerer notice and the opportunity to fix whatever is deficient or weak in its proposal. It certainly is. The shift is intended to liberate the government evaluators and negotiators from concentrating only on the weaknesses and deficiencies. The weaknesses and deficiencies are the mandatory part of discussions. They must be covered during discussions. But there is also the discretionary part of the discussions, the other aspects referred to in the FAR language, the bargaining that may be included in the discussions. This is where the new language is encouraging the government to negotiate more like a commercial buyer. Try to get the best deal you can possibly get for your agency. More freedom to be that smart buyer you referred to before, right? That's right, and in my opinion, this expansion of the potential scope of all the exchanges between the government and the offerers may be the biggest change to come out of the Part 15 rewrite. With all this broadening of the scope of exchanges, how do we avoid the prohibited practices of leveling and auctioning? Well, in another move designed to loosen things up, 
The Part 15 rewrite removed those traditional prohibitions, which were poorly defined and understood. In its place, FAR 15.306E simply and clearly prohibits conduct which would, one, favor one offer over another, two, reveal an offer's technical solution or intellectual property to another offerer, three, reveal an offerer's price without that offerer's permission, four, reveal the names of people providing past performance information, or five, improperly disclose source selection information. This has been really helpful. I now have a much better understanding of the phrase, the scope and extent of discussions are a matter of contracting officer judgment. I never really appreciated how much discretion and flexibility a contracting officer has to tailor the scope and extent of the discussions to suit the circumstances of a particular acquisition. Excellent. This is a critical concept for a good contracting officer to understand. Before we call it quits today, there is one more concept I'd like to talk to you about. I know we are supposed to conduct discussions that are meaningful, but I don't see the term mentioned anywhere in FAR 15.306, or anywhere else in the FAR for that matter. That's right. The phrase meaningful discussions does not appear in the FAR. It is a concept that comes from case law. Although the contracting officer has broad discretion and judgment in determining the scope and extent of discussions, that judgment is not unlimited. The case law has established a minimum level that the scope and extent of discussions must achieve. At a minimum, discussions must satisfy the fundamental legal principle that they be meaningful, equitable, and not misleading. So how do I determine what is necessary to satisfy this fundamental legal principle? I think the best way to give you an idea of how this fundamental legal principle is interpreted is to read you a sampling of quotes from the case law. These quotes describe the conditions under which the courts will generally consider discussions to be meaningful. Lead an offer into those weaknesses, excesses, or deficiencies in its proposal that must be addressed in order for the proposal to have a reasonable chance of being selected for an award, sufficiently detailed so as to lead an offer into the areas of its proposal requiring amplification or revision, generally lead the offers into the areas of their proposals that require amplification or correction without being misleading, should be as specific as practicable but there is no requirement that they be all-encompassing or extremely specific in describing the agency's concerns. Okay, if I were to draw a bottom line from these quotations, I would say that, for my discussions to be considered meaningful, I must put the offerer on notice of all those areas of its proposal that need to be addressed in some fashion, whether it be through amplification, explanation, or revision of the proposal in order for that offerer to have a reasonable chance of being selected for reward. Is that a good bottom line to take away from all this? Yes, that's a good bottom line. And I suggest that a best practice for achieving that bottom line, as well as the broad purposes expressed in FAR 15.306D, is to disclose to the offerer via an evaluation notice all negative findings related to that offerer's proposal this is the preferred business practice that has been designed into the ASSIST. Each of those evaluation notices should be as specific as practicable so that there is no question as to whether the offer is actually on notice of what the problem or issue is. But note that if you have advised an offer of your concern in this matter, there is no requirement that you raise the issue again in subsequent rounds of discussions, even where the issue continues to be a concern to you. Once is enough. Carol, this has been great. It's really helped to clear up a lot of my confusion about exchanges. Thanks for taking the time. You are very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Feel free to stop by again if you have any more questions.